these were a community of peoples. Mostly they were exiled uh, African runaway slaves. There were also some exiled indigenous people with the group. And then there were the uh, people that were of African descent, but they had been born in freedom somewhere. And so they were, that, those three groups comprised most of the uh, community that was there. Now, the story of the Maroons and the Maroon settlements in the swamp is actually a separate but connected story to the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad was a story that had its own life. That mostly occurred along the eastern boundary of the swamp, along the Dismal Swamp Canal. And that story is the story of facilitators or conductors or assistants that helped freedom seekers moving from the south to the north. So there was some connection back and forth between the people that came to live in the Dismal Swamp and with those that were just migrating north with the assistance of the Underground Railroad. The name Maroons, you can, it depends on what time in history you look back to its sources. The most uh, popular explanation for it now is in the Caribbean islands, a uh, hundred years before the people started settling, the Maroons started settling in the Dismal Swamp, there were already Maroon communities there. The slaves that had been brought to the Caribbeans for the plantation workers there escaped and went up into the high jungles in the islands, and they started forming Maroon communities there. And they were very powerful, and they did a lot of militia type activities, raiding the plantations and killing people. And uh, so they had a really bad reputation. They called them Cimarrons from the Spanish word that meant wild or unruly. It was also the term that they used for their feral cattle. So they had originally talked of their feral cattle when they talked about Maroons. Eventually they started talking about the runaway natives that had lived there that they had enslaved. And then eventually it became to the African slaves that ran away. And so it, it sort of had a progression over a, a century of time. As in other communities where there were Maroons, they really lived on the land where they were. So in the Dismal Swamp, there are plenty of wild fruits like pawpaw and wild grapes. There's lots of nuts. You, of course, you have all the game that's here that they could kill, fish that are here. Um, later, because the Maroons that lived in the Dismal Swamp it was a period of 250 years. So as their community became more advanced and developed, they probably had some subsistence farming that they would do. Maybe a runaway from the south had a handful of corn that he had in his pockets that he brought with them. So, you know, they could plant small crops on the dry lands because where they lived in the swamp were on little, uh, we refer to them as islands, and they're just areas that are slightly higher in elevation and they remain a little drier than the land around them. So they were able to, uh, you know, maybe have some small plots later, but not at first. Well, it's hard to say. Uh, evidence speaks evidence from uh, newspaper articles for people wanting runaways that they knew lived in the swamp, evidence from the archaeological work that we've done on the site work. We believe it was probably thousands over that 250 years. So at first a few and then the populations grew. After the Civil War, then the po the, the, the Relics in the ground tell us that that's when the communities dispersed. There is evidence of that. Uh, some of the, um, especially the uh, shingle makers, they would drop slaves off at the boundaries and send them in. And there are records where, okay, the slave that went in came out with more shingles than he could have made in a week. So. You know, we, we sort of take that as evidence that they were getting assistance from someone in the swamp. And maybe they did that to barter for things that they couldn't, for resources they couldn't get out of the swamp. But 
more important, they did not want to be found. So only with those folks that they had uh, deep trust in that they weren't going to uh, somehow or another expose them would they be trade through that. And on the islands where we've done the archaeological work, there's really not a lot of relic from the outside world. So that also makes us think that there wasn't a tremendous amount of trade going on because their goal was not to be found. The Civil War. Um, of course, you know, at that time, the freedom was given to the slaves. However, um, there was still a matter of trust, so we feel like it was a gradual disbursement of the people. We, we really don't have any historical evidence to, to guide us. We can only speculate that, but we know that the islands were no longer inhabited after that period of time, so, but we just expect that it was probably gradual. I think that's real interesting. And we do have those small relics in the uh, Smithsonian's Museum of African American History um, in Washington, D.C. There's a display that has some of those small relics and it tells the story. So what is left is, are those small relics but the descendants of the people that lived in the Dismal Swamp. We have that left, and we know that they have been dispersed into the communities around the swamp. So uh, the, the archeologist that was doing the work here, he actually interviewed some families that in their oral history, they tell of lives where they lived in the swamp. Their legacy is their story. I believe that that's it. Their story of their desire for freedom was so much stronger than the awful conditions that they endured in the swamp. So I believe that's their legacy. Mm -hmm.